Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our daily COVID-19 update uh, for the town of Plymouth. This is update number 31. It's coming to you live on April 24th at noon. I'm Steve Trifletti, your Plymouth Town moderator, and we'll be here each day, Monday through Friday at noon for this update. This forum is being brought to you live by PAC-TV on Comcast channels 13 and 15 and Verizon channels 43 and 47. You can also watch this on pac TV streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions for today's panel, please email them to plymouthinfo at pactv.org. These forums can be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. And today's participants joining Kenneth Tavares Matt Muratori and I will be uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti, uh, Amy Naples, also Peter Parcelin, Brian Palladino, and Roxanne Whitbeck. And we're going to begin, as we do each day, with a message from the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen, Kenneth Tavares. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ironically, uh, at this hour, if we weren't dealing with this uh, virus, we'd all be in Memorial Hall opening up the uh, 400th commemoration. Uh, unfortunately, as, as you know, we have been uh, reconfiguring the events and uh, the executive committee of the 400th met this week. And I think we're developing a plan that's going to be very beneficial to the town and to the citizens to both uh, commemorate uh, and celebrate the 400th anniversary of, of Plymouth. Uh, the silver lining in it is that uh, it's raining, and this would have uh, definitely uh, caused uh, some uh, some heartache uh, if we were going full speed ahead with the planning. Uh, I also want to remind you, uh, which I do every Friday, is to uh, take some time for yourself. I think the uh, the pressure is building on on everyone, you know, families. Uh, uh, being able to, uh, uh, actually not be able to, uh, to move about it as much as they would like to. And uh, I think that we all need to uh, go off to that corner wherever we're comfortable and um, take some time for ourselves. I do want to remind the community that the select board is meeting on uh, next Tuesday at five o'clock. Uh, we will have the, uh, the town manager and the finance director there to starting the discussion on finances and possible uh, alternatives that we may need to consider. Uh, the town moderator uh, will be present uh, to give us an update on town meeting and where we stand on trying to put that meeting together. The, the town clerk will be talking about the state of election and possibly the town election. And we will be talking to the police chief about the fines that have been proposed uh, by the Board of Health uh, if uh, someone disposes of uh, uh, PPE uh, uh, in an adverse way. So uh, again, I, I hope you all have a quiet weekend and that uh, uh, keep, keep up the work that you're doing. We, we, we are going to have, a, I think, a test uh, tomorrow. Uh, and that is the weather's going to be good. And uh, certainly from everyone that's speaking on the national and the state level, we need to keep that distance, wear those masks, and stay at home. I know it's getting hotter and hotter to do all this, but we, if we have the will, we will prevail. Thank you. Thank you. And that's Kenneth DeVaris. He's chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Each day we're coming to you live, and it's date stamped in the top right-hand corner. And also, we're trying to provide you with both officials and experts in fields that are responding to the coronavirus in order to provide you with verified and accurate information. As a follow-up to what uh, Selectman Chair Kenneth Tavares stated, uh, I will be participating at that meeting on Tuesday. And the Committee of Precinct Chairs, which is headed by Alan Costello, is currently conducting a survey of all town meeting members in order to get some survey results back as to the town meeting member uh, position regarding whether or not to move forward with the special and annual town meeting and whether it would be a virtual or in-person town meeting. We expect to have those results by Monday and we'll be providing them uh, to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Philip Trifletti, 
Uh, he is a primary care attending physician with Beth Israel Deaconess. And Bill, Phil, we want to welcome you back. And uh, Ken was just mentioning how we're hearing things from uh, state and national officials. And uh, I couldn't help but uh, since yesterday's uh, broadcast, we did receive, again, mixed messages at the national level regarding the type of treatment that people should follow uh, if they think they may want to uh, avoid the coronavirus. And uh, I'd just like to ask you, as part of your presentation, uh, what should we do when we hear uh, elected officials giving medical advice? And uh, do you have any suggestions for our viewers? Dr. Phil, welcome. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, appreciate, again, the opportunity to be on your show today and uh, to share my medical background with uh, the general public. Um, yeah, the first thing I, I was going to bring up, I thought was one of the more important topics is just I'm wondering exactly what Bill Belichick will be doing in the NFL draft today, because I'm sure that's, you know, a burning question on a lot of people's minds. So uh, I'm hoping for a great draft pick tonight. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but, you know, as far as the, the medical issues, um, you know, I, I did want to highlight a few things. Well, first of all, um, in, there have been stories included in the Plymouth uh, media, as well as in the Boston media about, uh, and also on national media and the TV um, reports about people leaving personal protective equipment on the streets and, uh, you know, not disposing of it properly. So I did want to just, you know, make a plug for that. If uh, there may be others on the the show today will be, you know, encouraging the same thing. But obviously, you know, we don't want people leaving contaminated materials around on the street. So, you know, I would urge people to, you know, dispose of this in trash, you know, properly and not not be leaving things around. Um, and as far as testing issues, you know, I still think that there's a relative scarcity of testing available. I know at the Beth Israel Deaconess, the Boston campus where I, I work predominantly. Um, you know, we have levels of priority. So we're still mostly only able to test, um, you know, different people with symptoms. And we're not at the point yet where we can uh, universally, you know, test everyone. But I think we're getting closer and closer to having more availability of this testing. I know on the BID Plymouth Hospital website, you know, just uh, encourages you to speak with your own primary care physician if you feel like you might need to be tested. But I, I do feel like we're we're getting you know, more and more supply available uh, for the people who need to be tested. Another interesting story that came up in the Boston Globe, and I also uh, attended a conference online with our chief of emergency medicine for our Boston campus. Um, most of the emergency rooms are seeing about a 50% decline in overall visits, and that has raised some concerns that you know, some people who are very sick are you know, not getting attention for important things like um, people who might develop abdominal pain and have appendicitis might be waiting two, three, four days before they come in, which makes them more at risk for complications of the appendicitis, having a rupture. Same thing for stroke. Some stroke victims have been waiting several days, even though they might have paralysis and they, they miss out on the opportunity to have some types of very important treatment to stop a stroke. So, um, you know, some of these uh, leaders in the emergency rooms in the city are certainly encouraging people to come to the emergency room if they have some type of serious illness that's not COVID related. Um, and uh, so I would encourage people to do that. The, the data that we have from our Boston campus is very, very good. And as far as they know, there have been no cases of patients being infected by coming into the emergency room. Um, currently, they're, they're not having any healthcare workers also who are using personal protective equipment appropriately. None of them are getting infected. And they do a very good job of separating the patients when they come in, ones that have respiratory complaints that would be high risk for COVID-19 infection versus other general patients. They separate them immediately. Um, but I think that the, the practices within the emergency rooms, I think you'll find you know, very safe so that if you do have a true medical emergency, you should go in. <clears throat> As far as some of the treatment issues, you know, still we don't have any treatment right now that's, you know, approved. Uh, so we don't know of anything that's definitely safe and effective. I think for hospitalized patients, they might still, you know, be tried on certain types of medications. You know, experts are trying to enroll as many patients who are sick 
um, into clinical trials when possible so we can try to you know, get more information to find out which medications actually do work. But right now, you know, we don't, um, you know, have any proven therapy. There's been a lot of interest in the convalescent plasma. I think there's only very limited institutions within our country that are uh, experimenting with that type of treatment. I've had people ask me about donating plasma. Uh, the American Red Cross can take plasma donations. However, at this time, you have to have a positive nasal swab test uh, at the beginning of your illness, and then you have to have a negative swab test at least 14 days after you were ill in order to be eligible. Uh, they may be changing their criteria. I heard in the media uh, this week that they may be changing over to allowing people to donate if they have a positive antibody test, and the antibody testing may be more available. I know our hospital should start doing that next Monday, and I know some of the private labs, uh, I have a private lab in my medical office um, some of the private labs do have availability for antibody testing. So I do think antibody testing is going to be um, more available, uh, even though, of course, we don't really fully understand, you know, what uh, positive antibodies mean, you know, in terms of preventing infection uh, for us later on. Uh, we should be able to utilize that at least for some of these issues like the convalescent plasma. Uh, some interesting stories. I, I attend a lot of conferences online with scientists here in the Boston community. Um, they had a great presentation this week about the homeless community in Boston. It was very interesting, all the different ways they've been caring for this population. But I found one of the most striking things was they already believe at least 10% of the homeless population is infected, and they believe it may be quite a bit more. In the news, you may have also seen reports about New York City, um, that the population study they've done there, they believe maybe 20% of people are already infected in New York City. Uh, I sort of look at that as a positive in some ways, um, you know, that we want to get to a point where, you know, when, when the, uh, we develop what's called the herd immunity, when about 50% of the population gets infected in any particular region or globally, um, this will in effect really stop the transmission and stop the epidemic. So if it's true that the population is, more and more people are getting infected, than we're actually aware of, you know, this may mean that, you know, we'll be coming to an end sooner rather than later. I realize um, nobody really knows the answer. There's a lot of epidemiologists who are predicting, obviously, several waves of illness that we, you know, as we, um, you know, start to do less social distancing, as has been recommended in some states, um, you know, that we'll probably have a rebound effect where there'll be more infections. And so that we'll probably have it going up and down for a period of time, the number of infections. And this could go on for a while, again, until we either reach this critical mass of people that are infected, about 50% of the population, or until we have a vaccine, which I think you know, is still uh, obviously being worked feverishly uh, throughout the world, but you know, it's still some time away before we can have the hope of having a vaccine. Uh, again, I like to encourage people to use the trackthecurve.com, uh, which you can access on the internet. Um, and I just looked at that this morning to look at Massachusetts to see, you know, have we reached the peak in terms of new cases in Massachusetts? Now, unfortunately, we have not. You know, I think our cases are still increasing. You know, there are other states and countries which are starting to see a downturn. The state of Washington is doing very well. The state of California, I think, is still climbing. Um, some of the countries like, you know, Italy, you know, has been on the decline. So, you know, there, there are some regions that are doing well, and there's other regions like Boston where in Massachusetts where we're still seeing some increase, so we've got a little bit more work to do. Uh, you know, I think the main message is continue with the social distance, distancing, the self-isolation as much as possible, especially if you're older um, and um, if you have any you know, serious medical diseases, obviously that's gonna put you at, at higher risk. Uh, when you do go out, obviously the hand washing is very important. Sanitizer, if you have it, you know, we have to wear in the state of Massachusetts, as you know, a face covering, uh, at least a scarf. Um, and um, so those are all the practices that we should still be putting in place. So uh, in answer to your question, Steve, and I think about, you know, maybe conflicting medical uh, information that you might get from government officials. I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, I do advise that you listen to medical specialists about medicine. So that, you know, for instance, um, on the national level, when um, the White House uh, task forces are giving 
there are talks, you know, I think listening to Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, who are medical experts is probably, you know, the best choice as opposed to listening to other government officials about the, some of the medical aspects of what's going on, whether it that have to do with what drugs to use or, you know, other issues regarding uh, social distancing uh, and mitigation strategies that we're still using. So that's basically um, all I had to say as a summary, and I'm happy to take questions later. And again, thank you very much for having me on the program today. And that's uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti, and he is a primary care attending physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, we're now going to go, and you can send and email your questions to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And today we welcome Brian Palladino, and he is principal at Plymouth Community Intermediate School. Uh, Brian, I want to—I know you come from a family of educators. Uh, with a shout out to your father Rocky, who was a principal, and to your mother Diana, who served on the Plymouth School Committee even before I served on the school committee. So uh, we thank all of your family members for educating in Plymouth, and welcome, Brian. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think uh, it's, you know, it's not easy to be at a dinner table in our family if you're not in education, because most of the conversation revolves around some type of schooling or education. But uh, yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a kind of a crazy time, um, you know, being a, a leader in a, in, a, in a building and also being a parent uh, who has uh, got three kids at three different levels, trying to be educated, trying to be the parent <laughs> and be, you know, the educator. Um, and I really do sympathize for some of the, you know, the families that are out there that are trying to do the same thing, trying to work and, and provide the education, um, you know, online. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's definitely been challenging. It's something that I can't lean on my father for or my mother for because nobody's really had to deal with uh, this type of situation and this type of learning. Uh, you know, we're all kind of learning as we go. And I think, you know, if there is a silver lining in all of this, I think we are becoming better educators because we're utilizing technology in a way we haven't had to before. Um, I myself, you know, uh, I'm on my computer basically from about eight o'clock till sometimes six, seven o'clock. And a lot of it is using technology that I never had to use before, like Zoom. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, we're all uh, going to be more equipped with and hopefully will make us better educators as we move through this uh, pandemic and, and out of the pandemic, I'm sure there's going to be things that we're going to we're using now that we're going to continue to use uh, moving forward. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it's something it's something that is challenging. And, um, you know, as as educators, we want to be in school. We want to be with kids. That's why we get into education. And it's definitely uh, that's been difficult, you know, you know, and, and for students. And I can just say in, in my house. You know, one of the things, the frustrating things that they uh, they get frustrated with is, you know, if they have a question or they aren't understanding something, you know, my youngest daughter said, well, I don't have Miss Shaw to ask the question, you know, because they're not right there in, in, in front of you. And I think the teachers on the flip side want to be with those kids, want to be in class. So um, it's a struggle for everyone, I guess is the best way to put it. But that's where we're at right now. And we're going to get through it. I think we're going to be better. We're going to be stronger um, and, and, you know, and, and come out of this. So uh, it's tough. Thank you. And that's Brian Palladino. He's a principal at Plymouth Community Intermediate School. You can send your questions to him and the other members of our <coughs> panel, PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And at this time, we welcome another principal. Yesterday, we had an elementary school principal. Brian is at middle school. And at the secondary level at the high school, uh, Peter Parcelin is the principal at Plymouth North High School. Uh, welcome, Pete. Thank you. And Pete, tell us a little bit about what's going on at Plymouth North High School. Um, so, like Brian mentioned, this is this is tough. This is unprecedented. Um, I think if there's one thing I've noticed through all this is is uh, that I'm pretty inspired by the way that the school community has kind of come together, how the parents have come together, uh, how the kids have risen to the occasion, um, and how the teachers are um, are really doing some amazing stuff. Um, it, learning is happening. Like it, it's. It doesn't look like it when you drive through the parking lot. It's 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 a downer when you go through there. Um, but but from what I'm seeing all day, learning new material is happening all day long. Um, and the teachers are more innovative than they've ever been before. Um, the we know that the classroom and physical teachers there it's it's irreplaceable. Um, I think parents. Can, I have a second grader. Parents can tell you that. Um, but the, the talent and the care that teachers have, um, have them do some amazing things. I was in 
um, an ELA department uh, Zoom meeting uh, between all the teachers from North and South yesterday, just kind of sitting back to see what they were doing. Um, and it, the stuff that we're talking about was awesome. Uh, the, they were talking about platforms and, and websites and materials they were using, like Google Meet, Google Classroom, but also Loom and Screencastify, stuff I've never even heard of before. Uh, they've gone out in month and found this stuff to do it. So the, the collaboration between the schools and the departments is awesome. Um, and we have really tried to make sure that we're emphasizing engagement over work production so that kids are really engaging in some kind of powerful learning experiences. And it, for us, I think the silver lining, we keep talking about that silver lining, um, it, we've been able to boil down learning to what really matters. I think we're, we are focused kind of as a whole district on like, what do we want kids to know in September when they come back? And what are the few things we can do to try and get them there from afar? So, um, and the kids themselves have been awesome. Like, they have, uh, they, they've struggled to do this. We've given out probably about a thousand homebooks to kids across the district, um, all while trying to maintain equity through all this stuff. About 96, we've, we've gotten data back from the first two weeks of remote learning. Um, about 96% of our kids are meeting the expectations in some manner. Um, and they're, the work they're creating, I'm able to kind of go in and see some of their stuff when I have an opportunity. The work they're doing is thoughtful and uh, independent, and they're coming up with very cool things. It's given us a real good opportunity, while in a terrible situation, to give kids kind of the, the opportunity to do cool things. Um, and our, our support staff is still digging. Uh, counselor, just this week, our counselors and assistant principals made 300 phone calls to families just Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Um, just yesterday, one of our assistant principals made a house call to a kid who didn't necessarily have the resources they need just to make sure he had everything he needed. Um, so the learning is still happening. The, but the thing that, that is weighing on my mind now, and I think everybody who's at a high school level across the state uh, that I talk to is saying the same thing. Um, the, when Governor Baker made that most recent announcement extending the, the learning for uh, the end of the year, I immediately thought about the seniors. Um, and this, this is a really great class. Um, they're starting their own businesses. Uh, they're signing up for Division I sports. The, the way they've shown how they care about each other and care about kids with special needs and stuff um, is amazing. Uh, and I know we are now trying to collaborate uh, between both schools um, on how to handle all these senior events. Dr. Maestas put out that video, which I think we all agree with. Um, and I, our focus now is trying to figure out the answers and the logistics on how to make this work in this scenario, right? Uh, but I know that like I see from this district uh, a collaboration on how to create this moment for these kids. Um, they feel all this loss of opportunity. And so I think we're struggling now on how to transition this moment for the rest of their lives to a moment of a, a memory of a special experience rather than a memory of kind of a lost opportunity. So we're, we're struggling in this moment to try and figure out those answers, but I know we're all really inspired by these kids. I mean, I know parents are struggling. Um, so I, I think we've worked hard to try and create this remote learning plan that gives them some consistency every week, um, some flexibility throughout the week, because I know everybody's got stuff going on, um, and some clarity on what we're looking for. Um, and all of it is is to try and make sure when these kids come back in September that they have um, a, an even playing field of learning that they've had to start off with next year. Because, I mean, that's going to be a tough situation to get there to. So um, there's a lot of collaboration and thought going on and a lot of work, even though when you drive through the parking lot, um, it's it's just tough. So um, that's I think that's where we're at. We're all we're all digging in to try and figure out the best answer on how to do the right thing for learning and the right thing for these kids, mm -hmm. principals, and parents. Who I know from my personal experience, trying to get my eight year old to to get work done. Um, how we can just help them get get through this? You know? Thank you, uh, Peter Parslin. He is the principal for Plymouth North High School. He'll be here for your questions. Plymouth Info at PACTV.org. And we now welcome back Roxanne Whitbeck, who is the veterans agent for the town of Plymouth. And uh, Roxanne, I understand you have another program that you're rolling out for veterans. 
Um, yes, we do. Um, first and foremost, I just want to remind everybody that our, our mission remains the same, and that's taking care of our local veterans. Um, we can't do it face-to-face -face like we like to, but we have been having great success um, reaching most of them via telephone. Um, I have gone to some of their houses. Um, I have met some of them at the town hall where we go outside and, you know, keep the social distancing and, and chat that way. But um, so our mission has remained the same and we've had pretty good luck with that. I think all of our veterans feel that they're not alone, that they, they always have a lifeline, whether it's a, a telephone call or, or if they want to, um, you know, even come to the town hall to drop something off. We, uh, we make exception and go out there and meet them because we we're still not open. Um, Monday, uh, 427 from 10 to 12, we're going to be having a um, food drive at the American Legion. And that's gonna be sponsored by the Mass Military Support Foundation. And basically they're going to be bringing 100, um, 100 box meals or boxes of food, um, non-perishable items for our veterans so that that will kind of help out in the long term. Um, so that's gonna be Monday, 427 from 10 to 12. Um, we're probably, um, at our goal, I'm guessing, because we partnered also with Kingston, Plimpton, and um, Carver. So we do have, um, you know, surrounding communities that are going to be participating as well. So I do anticipate a really good turnout for that. But secondly, um, if anyone needs food here locally, we have the Nathan Hale Foundation, and they're located at 116 Long Pond Road, and they have been phenomenal. Um, they are, they've been getting good um, supplies of food. Um, they either you can go pick it up there or they'll bring it, they'll deliver it to you. So they've been really, really helpful. Um, I did talk to Chris and they are expecting a big shipment on Monday. So any of the people that we can't help with our food drive, I'm going to be sending them down to Chris. Um, Chris also does a, um, Chris and Diane also do Saturdays at the farm, uh, the Three Hearts Farm, where they'll be um, giving away things that veterans need. And that's a veterans only event. Um, Nathan Hale, I mean, they surviving spouses or whatever can get things, but this, uh, this is a, a veterans only event on Saturday. And they usually do that from 10 to um, 12. So I'm going to be joining them on Saturday to, um, I think they're, I forget what they're giving away this this Saturday, but um, I think one of the items is toilet paper, but I thought that was kind of funny. Um, also on a, on a sad note, unfortunately we had to make a decision about our Memorial Day parade, um, which we're going to have to postpone. Um, so what I have suggested to, and spoken to all the veterans groups in town and, and they're all in agreement is that we're going to do a dual ceremony in November. Um, we're going to combine our Veterans Day ceremony and a Memorial Day um, event. Uh, they're two very different celebrations, but instead of not having the Memorial Day event, I mean, Memorial Day isn't something that you can put off to like June or something. It is a very specific day. So we are trying to make it where we could put it with another veterans, uh, another special holiday. And like I said, it's two very, very different um, events but we got to do so we got to do something to honor uh, our our veterans that have um made the ultimate sacrifice um and that has also led to the postponement of um placing the flags on the veterans graves which we do the weekend uh the saturday prior to um memorial day unfortunately my flags are um sitting on a loading dock somewhere that i, I can't get i won't have access to them until um June sometimes. So um, I know that's not an ideal answer because we like to have those flags fresh and crisp for Memorial Day, but that's just not going to happen this year, unfortunately. And in closing, I just would like to um, just remind everybody, if you know a veteran in need, please have them call me. Um, I will make every effort to get back to them via phone or do a, do a, a house call if it's safe. Um, if they need financial assistance through Mass General Law Chapter 115. I mean, I take those applications every day. We're processing them and Boston's working with us. So we are having very good luck with that. But um, like I said, our, our first and foremost mission is, is taking care of our vets. And I think that we are, we're doing okay with that. And thanks for having me on the show again. Thank you, Roxanne Wickbeck, the veterans agent for the town of Plymouth. Uh, please email your questions, plymouthinfo at pactv.org. And now we're going to our daily business segment, and today we're joined by Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. 
Welcome, Amy. Hi, Steve. Thank you again for having me. Always a pleasure to be here. Um, today, I figured with the new town order regarding face coverings um, that will be in place beginning April 29th, and as I always do, I want to encourage our viewers to support our local businesses. Um, the chamber has created a listing of the local businesses where you can purchase those face masks from. We have three local small businesses who are making both adult and children's masks. You can do so by purchasing them online and they will be delivered to you. So you can find all the details on at our website, PlymouthChamber.com on the COVID-19 page. This is a very easy way to support local. A very informative webinar this morning with state representatives Kathy Lenatra and Matthew Muratori. Our attendees had the opportunity to ask questions to help them navigate through this time and important items were brought to our attention, which was great. We hold these weekly educational webinars every Friday morning at 10 a.m. The Chamber is continuously working with our business community to provide important information and resources. And although there are so many unknowns still at this time, we are working to address each question a business has. One key advice I thought I would leave with our business owners today is don't assume anything. It was brought up this morning in our webinar and I thought that was a great takeaway to communicate to you all. Be sure you're communicating and in touch with professionals, the proper professionals that can help you with your business. For example, if you applied for the payroll protection program, be in constant communication with your business banker. Don't assume that it's all set. As always, I'm here to answer any questions or help you navigate through this time. You can do so by emailing me at amy, A-M-Y, at PlymouthChamber.com or by calling me at 508-830-1620. And also today, um, as I do every Friday, is our Feel Good Friday. Um, so I'd like to highlight some great stories that are happening in the community. Today and every day, we, we cheer for the individuals in our community, especially our essential workers and those who are working tirelessly on the front line. So I wanted to share um, the first business, Second Wind Brewery, has launched a debt of gratitude, which is the release of three IPAs, along with their friends at two other local breweries, to support healthcare workers and first responders. Pro from those three releases will be used to purchase gift cards from local restaurants that are vital to the community's culture. All of the gift cards will then be donated to essential workers on the front lines. It's a wonderful say, way to say thank you and pay tribute to those folks, I think. The second business is Standard Mon Modern Printing Company. Their embroidery operators and seamstresses are producing cloth and paper face masks and the finishing department has been producing face shields, which have been donated to the MBTA, local police, fire, and local businesses like the YMCA and homeless outreach agencies. So we love seeing members of our community step up and support our frontline workers and think they deserve a plug um, for their wonderful efforts. So that's our business update and our feel good story, Steve. Thank you, Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We're going to go right to our daily update from the state with Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Welcome, Matt. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see everybody. Um, Amy, it was great to be on uh, with you this morning and Catherine Archer. We had a lot of good businesses on there. I think we got a lot of good information out. I got a lot of input, input back as well. And we'll, we'll, we'll run that up the chain to the administration on some of those questions. Um, Roxanne, I will see you on, um, on Monday at 10 o'clock. Uh, yes, you will. Thank you so much for helping us. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. Kathy Lenatra and I were at uh, Hot Farm with, with Chris Hart and Diane on Saturday giving out food to some of the veterans. So you, you guys are doing some terrific work with these veterans. So we thank you for what you're doing. And thank you. Brian and Pete, God love you guys for what you're doing, the teachers. I've got four girls at home, two middle school, <laughs> school girls. Uh, and trying to get through this remote learning is... It's, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> but I do have my, I don't know if you can see it, but I have my Plymouth North and South shirt on today. <laughs> okay, they're big to Plymouth South, but we're thinking of Plymouth North as well. And, and we have a daughter graduating, and I know you all come up with something very special for our eighth grader who's going into high school next year and our senior who's going to college next year. So uh, we thank you for what you're all doing. 
Uh, Steve, I have a, a quick update today. First of all, the governor is on at uh, two o'clock today. Uh, it's always great to have Dr. Trifoletti on because it helps him with the whole health part of this whole presentation. So he took it all on today, which is great. Um, so the governor will come out today as we know the extension uh, is, is uh, for the emergency is, is May 4th. He's expected to come out at any time now. I'm not sure if it'll be today or early next week to talk about the extension beyond May 4th. Uh, that should be something that's coming up soon. With regard to the testings, uh, we actually increased our testing almost double um, yesterday um, from, from the day before to yesterday. These numbers are as of Thursday, April 23rd. Uh, the numbers increased to 14,614 tests. So we're at 195,076 testing tests that have been done. Uh, that's approximately 2.8% of, of, the, of the population of the Commonwealth. With regard to those have been confirmed, those increased, obviously with the numbers of testing, double the increase in, in confirmed cases have gone up as well. We increased in one day to 3,079. Now we have a total of 46,023 confirmed cases with the average age of 54 years old. 8% um, of, of those that are confirmed have been hospitalized. And that's 23.6% of, of those tested have been confirmed with COVID-19. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the deaths went up again yesterday dramatically. They went up to 178 more deaths uh, to 2,360. Uh, five, a little over 5% of all deaths, uh, are, are deaths are occurring with those that have COVID-19. And the average age of the death of those that are dying are um, 82 years old. Uh, and 98% 98, 98 of all deaths um, have had an underlying condition. We're also, uh, with, the, with the deaths, we've also talked about the long-term care facilities. Um, that, um, the number of deaths now uh, are up to um, uh, 1,316 in long-term care facilities. So it's 50%, 56% of all deaths have occurred in these long-term care facilities, uh, which include uh, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, and rest homes. And uh, we have 684 of those in the Commonwealth. And uh, with regard to the number of tests uh, in long-term care facilities, there have been uh, almost 12,000 tests, 11,796 have been tested um, and completed at 341 of our, uh, out of our 684 uh, facilities in the Commonwealth. Uh, 8,435 have been confirmed with the coronavirus in, and at least one in uh, confirmed case in 283 of our homes in the Commonwealth. Plymouth County shot up a little bit too with a number of 276 cases. Uh, they are now at 3,529 cases, uh, which is a little less than 1% of the population of Plymouth County. Um, and the number of deaths uh, associated with those that have been confirmed with the coronavirus is 5% now uh, with uh, a total of 176 deaths in Plymouth County. And uh, Plymouth, uh, his uh, numbers are 141 cases of coronavirus. Uh, that's up 10 from the day before uh, with uh, five deaths. As Dr. Trifoletti said, the big message that came from the governor yesterday was the public service announcements uh, that our hospitals are open um, and they shouldn't be delaying, you should not be delaying any, um, any care at all. And, and you should be seeking medical care if you need it for anything, uh, anything that you may have, do not delay your care. Um, in addition, um, I know we talked the other day about foods, uh, food uh, with Social Community Action Council, and I know Roxanne and, and Chris Hart are helping food for the, the homeless as well. The governor's put together a food security task force um, and look, they're gonna be looking at issues related to the food supply chain. Um, and they're gonna address uh, the uh, an idea immediate needs uh, as well as looking at the uh, maximum access for enrollment and participation and, and, and creating and implementing plans uh, for short and long-term goals as well. Because uh, we do see that for the food is becoming a great, uh, great uh, source of uh, angst for a lot of people out there. Uh, the schools are doing a trem tremendous job feeding the students as well and the families, uh, but it's, 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 getting, uh, it's getting a little worse out there for the food. So we're gonna be, forming this task force to help folks with that. So uh, with that, that is the update uh, for today, Steve. And again, the governor will be on at two o'clock, so we should have a lot more to talk about on Monday. Thank you, that's Representative Matthew Muratori, Plymouth State Representative.
We're now going to go to our questions that are coming to you from Plymouth Info at PACTV.org. And before we do that, uh, just to let you know, on Monday we have a lineup that includes Chris DeBona. He is from Brewster Ambulance. We welcome back Karen Keene, the Director of Public Health for Town of Plymouth, and Sarah Cloud from the Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth Campus, Leah Filson. She's the Executive Director for C. Plymouth, and Amy Naples will be joining Matt, Ken, and I on Monday. And at this time, we're going to go to our first question, which is for Kenneth Tavares uh, as Chair of the Board of Selectmen. And Ken, the question is, uh, does the Board of Selectmen need to mandate the wearing of masks? Ken. No, that was done. The uh, order that was issued this week and is effective next week was done by the Board of Health. The role that the Board of Selectmen plays is they did attach a fine to it, but the fines can only uh, be placed on the community by the Board of Selectmen. So when the uh, discussion item comes up at uh, our meeting on Tuesday, we will be discussing the, uh, uh, the uh, actual fines and not the, uh, the, the order itself. Kenneth Tavares is the chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. We're next going to go to Dr. Phil. And the question is on the subject of the herd goal, and the viewer asks, is the goal of 50% of the population to become infected? That seems to give support to those who wish to open the country prematurely. Could you comment on that? Yes. Um, so I wouldn't actually define as a goal to reach 50% infection rate. I mean, I think you know, our goal would be to stop the spread of the virus. And, um, and right now, we can only do that through social distancing and mitigation. But um, going forward over the next few years, it's possible that we're not going to have any intervention like a vaccine that can stop the spread of the virus. So when you're thinking of it in, in theoretical terms, in order for us to get to a point where we no longer have to worry about a risk of, of an epidemic still existing in our neighborhoods and communities, normally what happens is you you have to get to about a 50% saturation or 50% of the population has to be infected so that the epidemic stops. So, um, so I, I wouldn't say that um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, to you know, purposely get to that, but you know, ultimately we probably will get to that because we probably won't have a vaccine fast enough. And so that's probably how the epidemic will, will end up uh, finishing. Now, what you probably heard about in the last few months, a lot of, you know, from Dr. Fauci and others about this so-called flattening the curve. So um, one of the things we've been trying to do with the, what's called the mitigation strategies, the social distancing, um, is we're trying to prevent the curve from accelerating at a very, very fast rate. And because if it were to do that, much like we described in Italy and probably to a lesser extent in New York City, what happens is if too many people get infected too fast, if you get start moving towards that 50% too fast, if you're not taking precautions to you know, um, stay at home advisory like we do here in Massachusetts, then what would happen is you would exceed the capacity of our healthcare system to care for patients who are very ill. Only about 20% of people will actually get what we'll call you know, more severe illness and about 5% get critical illness. That could land them in the ICU. You know, it turns out that you know we don't want to run out of capacity for ICU beds, ventilators, and um, those are still very much life-saving treatments. At our Boston campus, for instance, about 50%, a 40 to 50% of the people are getting off the ventilators. It may not be even being slightly better than that. So, you know, having that capacity to put people on ventilators is a life-saving treatment. We don't want to eclipse the capacity. Um, one of the things I can say that uh, I do want to put a plug in actually for our um, all our you know public officials here in the state of Massachusetts. I mean, I think the the work that they've done on the disaster preparedness side and executing um, you know the needs of what's needed to you know prevent any uh, serious shortage of you know beds or or ventilators or you know protective equipment. I think our state government ha has done a great job is supporting the public, there's no indication that we're going to exceed capacity at this time. But the reason we're not going to exceed the capacity is because 
you know, we've been doing all this uh, social distancing, which allows us to keep the rate of infections at a slower rate. Uh, my brother, uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti, uh, primary care physician, Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, we're now going to go to questions for Brian Palladino and Peter Parslin. Uh, I'm going to ask both of you, begin with Brian. Uh, and a viewer writes, while we're all becoming accustomed to remote learning and trying to find the rhythm, how as families can we balance the mental health of our children with the expectations of remote learning and the loss of the school year? Brian. I think our councils have been doing a great job reaching out to families um, that they're aware of, but I would always say um, our counselors, our teachers are available um, through their platforms. Uh, our counselors are holding groups uh, to support mental health. Uh, but I, and I would also say, I think our teachers are very sensitive to the fact that this is stressful, not just the, the schooling part of that. Always reach out to your teacher, um, guidance counselor, admi uh, administrator, and we will definitely be in touch to help support you with that. Um, but as, as uh, Mr. Crossland had said, you know, we're looking at engagement. And if, if the work is becoming too stressful or, um, or managing it is becoming too stressful, always reach out. I think that's the important part is just having that open communication because we want to support you with this 100%. Um, and the only way we know, it, you know, if you're having difficulties or uh, stressing out about something regarding schooling is for us to reach out. It's not like, Again, I mentioned having those kids right in front of our teachers or walk by our counselors uh, on the way to another class, but we don't have that right now. So uh, we're really relying on um, the, the communication uh, with students and families. And I know um, that our teachers are, are holding Google Meets. So there is that that face-to-face -face time that is happening, um, you know, usually once a week, uh, if not more. So uh, just communication is gonna be key to get us through this because you know, we were all very hopeful that after March 1st, uh, we were going to be back to school that following Monday. And of course, like uh, as you mentioned, um, that's going to be extended throughout the year. So these things are going to, uh, are going to get more stressful. And, and, and the only way we can help support the families um, and, and the students is that, is that communication. So if things are uh, struggling, I have just sitting here in this, uh, in this uh, TV show that I, I've had e emails from parents saying, you know, concerned about certain stress levels. And you know, we want to be on top of that because, you know, most important thing right now is to make sure students, families, teachers, we're all healthy and we're all supported. So I would only advise just keep communicating. Uh, we can provide resources that um, you may not be aware of. Our counselors have um, on their Google Classrooms have put resources out there for families around food banks, mental health, um, you know, different strategies that you can use to, to help support uh, our students' mental health. So Look on uh, uh, Annie Kowalski um, is our adjustment counselor. She put a nice uh, Google Classroom together with all these resources. But again, even just an email to her, Lori Rush, any of the guidance counselors, any of the administrators, we will be there to support you and give you information that, that we have. So again, just keep communicating. Thank you. Brian Palladino is the principal at Plymouth Community Intermediate School. And Peter Parslin, uh, what can you tell us about uh, dealing with the stress that your high school students are experiencing? I think Brian is exactly right. Um, I like I know that we are. I emphasize it to our teachers. Our teachers are parents too, so they're doing this stuff. Uh, they're they're encountering the same stressors that the parents themselves are. And I've said it from the beginning: do what you can. Like this is not normal. This is not. Nobody is expecting um, anybody to to be operating at full capacity right now because that's not a thing. So. Um, I, like I know um, our big message is to just do, do what you can and invest yourself in learning, try and keep up, but, but you know, don't overwhelm yourself. Um, and like, I know interface is a really valuable resource and they've put specific, I've forwarded that to parents um, at North. Um, I know that they have a lot of resources for parents on ideas about how to, to handle that. stuff. And so um, I know our counselors all have that information. So, just tell us. We're happy to help. I know everybody is the, the overwhelming message to me uh, through all the emails and contact I've gotten is everybody wants to support everyone. This, this is a community where everybody takes care of each other um, and that and everybody's willing to do it. So don't hesitate to tell us. I think that's the, the key. Peter Parslin is a principal of Plymouth North High School. Each day we ask our participants to give us a closing statement and what takeaway they'd like our viewers to remember. We're going to go to Roxanne Whitbeck 
the veterans agent, uh, Roxanne, what do you want our viewers to remember today for our veterans? Um, basically that they're, they're not alone. I mean, a lot of my older veterans live by themselves and obviously it's a feeling of isolation for them, but, um, just to let them know that we're here, you know, we're going through the same thing that they are and, um, we're here for them, like whether it's a phone call or whether I uh, go for a visit and we have the social distancing visit, we're right here. And, and that's not going to change unless we get directed otherwise, but, um, we're always, we're right here making sure that our veterans are well taken care of. Roxanne Whitbeck, thank, thank you. you. The veterans agent, town of Plymouth, uh, Amy Naples, what would you like to leave our viewers with as a thought on this Friday? As always, please support your local businesses. The weekend typically sparks takeout. And as a reminder, you can find a complete list of restaurants offering takeout and delivery at PlymouthChamber.com. Um, also, I wanted to mention today, it's a very special day in my family, and I know they are watching as they do every day. So I wanted to wish my parents, Jim and Linda Carpenter, a happy 50th wedding anniversary. So it's yeah. a nice day for us. Um, and lastly, to my fe fellow panelists, keep up the great work. Amazing things in our community with our students, residents, veterans. We are so lucky to have you leading the charge. We are certainly in this together. So as always, distance socially and support locally. Amy Naples, Executive Director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We're going to go back to Brian Palladino. Brian, what do you want our viewers to remember today? Yeah, just, uh, you know, take care of yourselves, take care of your family. Um, this is a unique time, and, and I think our health and well-being is what's most important right now, and the things we're doing will hopefully help that. Uh, and just know, I know I can speak for all the schools and the Plymouth Public Schools uh, from top down, is we want to support you, want to help you, so please reach out for anything that you need, whether it's education, mental health, food. Um, you know, we have a lot of great people that work for our district that are student and family focused and we want to do whatever we can to help and support you. So please uh, don't be afraid to reach out. There's no stupid questions. There's no stupid asks. We want to help you. Brian Palladino is the principal at Plymouth Community Intermediate School. Uh, Peter Parcelin, you're the third principal we've had on the past couple of days. Uh, what would you like our viewers to take away from today's program? Um, I, I think the key is that uh, our, our school is more than just the building. Our teachers are working hard and being creative. Our counselors are supporting every single kid. Um, our secretaries are still supporting families all day long. Our custodians are rotating to maintain the facilities. Our administrators are collaborating across the entire district. Uh, and I think the, the key is our kids are awesome. Our kids are an inspiration. Um, they're on top of keeping up their, with their work. Many of them are out there working in nursing homes. Uh, they're out there working in grocery stores. They're babysitting siblings while their parents are on the front line. Um, so I love these kids, uh, and I am really inspired by them. So if there's any takeaway, I think, today is that, you know, our kids and our teachers and our staff might not be in the building, but um, we're, we're still going strong, uh, and, and we will continue to until the last day of school. Peter Parsland is the principal Plymouth North High School. We're going to go back to Dr. Philip Trifletti. Phil, um, you're doing telemedicine, telehealth, uh, and we want to thank you for helping us with our medical component. What do you want our viewers to remember uh, from today's presentation? Sure. I have uh, three points to summarize. First of all, you know, a lot of people are afraid of getting the infection and bringing it home. And what actually happens in the households is there's probably about a 10% risk of it spreading in the household when it gets there. So the vast majority of people, if they did get it in their household, would not catch it from some somebody. And I think that's something that's like a reassuring notion to know that if you were to have one member of your household infected, doesn't mean that everybody else will get infected. It's actually the opposite. Um, the same goes for surviving. A lot of people, I think, worry about surviving the infection, as we, we've talked about, and as Matt had mentioned, you know, when people are over the age of 80, this is really the highest risk group. But even in that group, people probably that living here in the community, they probably would have over an 80% survival rate if they were living in the community. If they were in a skilled nursing facility, they'd probably have maybe a 60 or 70% survival rate, even the, the most uh, elderly and uh, infirm of us uh, in skilled nursing facilities. So, so most people will survive, even even those in the high risk group. So I think that's another thing just to keep in mind. Uh, if you're in a low risk group, the rate of survival is extremely high. 
So another piece of good news. And then the last thing, going back to your question, Steve, at the beginning, you know, uh, who should you be listening to? I mean, I think as much as you can listen to medical experts, you know, if you have a primary care physician that you can rely on, if you have specific questions about your own health or your family's health, obviously consult them. You know, if you're listening to the media or if you're going online, um, you know, cdc.gov is obviously a great, you know, general resource that you can use. Uh, but I would say as much as you can to try to filter the information and for your filter, try to rely on medical experts as much as possible. Thank you, Dr. Philip Trefletti. He is a primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. And now we're going to go back to Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Matt, your closing statement. Thanks, Steve. And again, thanks to all our panelists. And, you know, what I got out of this today was that we have such a great community. Uh, you know, whether you're educators, you're in business, you're, you're in the medical field, uh, you're, you're elected official, we're all in this together. Um, we're all um, working on the same goal of trying to get back to a new normal at some point. Um, but uh, in order to do that, we, we need to uh, do the three, three things I talk about every day. First of all, stay informed. Uh, as Dr. Trifoletti said, you know, if you have uh, medical questions or concerns, contact your, your PCP, or you can go uh, ask questions to bowie.com forward slash mass. Uh, you know, stay informed with uh, going, getting a text uh, by texting COVID MA to 888-777. Uh, ask questions by calling the state number 211 if you have questions, or just go to mass.gov forward slash COVID-19 to get more information. But stay informed, um, you know, stay, stay calm, continue doing what you're doing, enjoy the time you have with your family. Um, you know, um, we will get back to a new, uh, to a new normal at some point. Uh, we're just not there yet, and we need to stay home. Uh, it is still affecting people. Uh, we are a hot spot in the whole country now probably the world at this point um, in here in Massachusetts. So we just need to be diligent. Uh, we will, you know, we will see that curve start to flatten soon, but we're not there yet. We're still a week or two uh, from even getting close to that. So uh, stay, stay home. Uh, if you do have to go out, wear a mask. Um, and, and remember the more we come together um, by staying apart, the faster we'll get back to the people that we love and the things that we love to do. So thanks again, Steve and PAC TV, and I uh, hope you all have a good weekend, and we'll talk on Monday. Thank you. Good words from Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori and from all of our members of our panel. Uh, they included Dr. Philip Trifletti, also Principals Brian Palladino and Peter Parcelin, uh, Roxanne Whitbeck, the Veterans Agent Amy Naples, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce, and they join Representative Muratori and the Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Ken Tavares. Ken, what are your closing thoughts today? Thank you, Steve. Uh, well, what I'm reflecting on today is uh, the panel and the diversity that we had today and have had all week and actually for 31 episodes. The, we walk away uh, at the end of this program knowing that this community is going to be stronger for it. The, uh, the work that people are doing individually or the groups they represent are phenomenal. It's so hard to call out certain groups because we always miss someone, but uh, great job. People are doing what they should. Uh, I look at the challenges that the Board of Selectmen uh, faces, and they fall into two categories, economic and human. And I believe so strongly that if we take care of the human, the economic will follow. And I think that we have another opportunity, as I said earlier this weekend, to, uh, to prove that. Protect your families. Stay home. If you do go out, Make sure you keep the distance, wear a mask, do the things to protect one another. That's our job right now. And hopefully we're going to be successful at it sooner rather than later. Thank you and see you Monday. Thank you. That's Kenneth Tavares. He's chair of the Plymouth Board of Selectmen. And we will see you on Monday. We'll be joined uh, with Ken, Matt, and we'll have Chris DeBona, a first responder, Brewster Ambulance, also Karen Keene. She's the Director of Public Health here in Plymouth. We're going to welcome back Sarah Cloud. She's Behavioral Health and Social Work at Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth Campus and Amy Naples, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce, and Lee Filson from C. Plymouth. They'll all be joining us here on Monday at noon. We want to thank all of you for tuning in today. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. Have a great day. <laughs>